I'm super excited about this conversation tonight because it's one of the most pressing issues, particularly this week. So welcome everyone. And now I'd like to hand over to Matt Shaw. Hello everyone, welcome. Yeah, I'm Matthew Shaw and um, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening Jazz O'Hara, um, United Nations and TEDx speaker. Jazz is the founder of the Worldwide Tribe, an organisation and online community raising awareness about the refugee crisis, while also supporting those caught up in it. As a writer for the Huffington Post, winner of Marie Claire's Future Shaper Awards and member of Amnesty International's Collective, Jazz has become a leading voice on the topic of migration from her unique and relatable perspective. And we also have Steve Savali uh, from Asian Dub Foundation with us in conversation tonight as well. Um, Steve, Asian Dub Foundation formed in 1993 at Community Music's original home in Farringdon. Steve joined in 1994 and helped transform them into a powerful live act who went on to play to huge crowds around the globe as they still do. In keeping with ADF's strong anti-racism stance and belief in music's and power to, to educate and liberate, in 2009, Steve presented the Music of Resistance series for Al Jazeera TV, telling the stories of musicians who fight repression and sing about injustices. Recently, uh, the Asian Dub Foundation release coming over here. It was number one on the official UK charts and the official download charts for the first week of 2021, our Brexit number one with profits going to the Kent Refugee Action Network. So let's begin, Steve, with um, a little bit more about how that felt and what was going on and, and how that links through the entire journey of Asian Dub Foundation and, and, and for you as well, uh, and bring us up to date, please. All right, you want me to talk about coming over here first? Yeah. Yeah, all right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, um, it was, uh, we, we came up with the track with uh, Stuart Lee, uh, did this uh, incredible sketch quite, quite a few years back now, where he parodied anti-immigration rhetoric um, with particular reference to the UKIP leader at the time. And a lot of people that I know, people that never heard of Stuart Lee or had no interest in mainstream BBC comedy, this sketch made its way uh, to us. And um, I, I don't think it's even speaking to Stuart himself, um, he didn't realize uh, quite the nerve that he touched with a lot of black Asian people, BAME people who grew up in this country, particularly uh, during the seventies and eighties. And um, the sketch pillories and skewers basically sort of a general ignorance um, about the history of immigration in Britain. And actually, I, I, I owe it to Matt because um, what happened was we had um, a track that was really, um, that, had, that we'd forgotten about, an instrumental. And I went to Matt's uh, festival, Sea Change Festival, and Stuart was hosting a lot of events there, doing lots of interviews, as, as he does, um, talking about a documentary about the band, The Nightingales. And then when I got home, I remembered the sketch, listened to it, and then I had the, the kind of unused instrumental up at the same time, and decided to put it together in an afternoon and um, did it and sent it to our manager and said, oh, well, we'll never get, we'll never be able to use this and, uh, because, um, you know, no one's going to give us permission. But then Bobby said, Bobby Marshall, our manager said, yep, yeah, sure, let, let's go. Let's see what he said. Stuart loved it. And so we eventually, because of lockdown and all of Stuart's gigs being cancelled, uh, he was able to come and do a video as well. So that went up and uh, we saw online, people started seeing it and saying, well, why did, this should be the Christmas number one. And then we had the idea, what, what better thing to do with this track than to get a massive campaign together to get it to the top of the charts the day that, that Britain officially leaves the EU. And on top of that, we'll make sure that, it, that all the funds raised from it um, goes to something related to the lyrics and going to something that's uh, happening right now. So we got in touch with uh, a group I know that you've been in touch with and uh, work with Jazz, uh, the Kent Refugee Action Network. And so the track, um, 
all, all profits from the track go towards the Kent Refugee Action Network, which uh, is right at the front line of the refugee and migration crisis in this country, uh, taking in as it does Kent and Calais and Dover and all those uh, touch points. Um, and so we're very happy to do that. And it was a success coming over here, a track that um, parodies anti-immigration rhetoric, ridicules it, was actually the number one best-selling single in Britain on New Year's Day 2021. Um, I, I think it probably hit the sort of, I mean, we knew nothing about charts. Right? We knew nothing about charts. And I don't know any musician who cares a damn about charts. Um, but it did get a lot of publicity, especially on Twitter. We had a million views in about two weeks. And a lot of, what it was cool about it was it was a defiant cheer, a defiant laugh against the culture of xenophobia, culture of extreme nationalism, which has been so cynically kind of kindled, particularly by this government and the hard line right wing, the hard right Brexiteers, who are continuing to do so. And uh, they've got their uh, nasty cheerleader in power at the moment, uh, Pretty Patel, uh, who's just announced the most appalling kind of restrictions on seeking asylum. So it continues. Um, so that, that's the background behind the track. But I mean, it, for us, it's, I think, probably the most successful, the most interesting sort of um, journey, artistic journey for ADF and the band, because really the whole band itself is uh, from its inception, immigration and border issues are at the heart of the group. It's its uh, natural artistic territory. Hey, perhaps we should play the track. Perhaps we should play the track. Then I'll go on to talk about a bit more of the, the you know, ADS form in this area. So, um, so if you, sorry, who am I asking? Is it um, Miriam or Alicia? Oh, Miriam. Yeah, if you could play Coming Over Here. I've sent Coming you the Coming Over link. Here, of course. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you're going to get an advert. I'm going to get an ad. I'm going to come out of this and listen to an ad by myself, and then I'll... Uh... Well, here's the thing. Guess the irony, a lot of people, when they clicked on coming over here, the ad that came up was Nigel Farage um, parody, um, um, trying to peddle some insurance scheme, which I thought was very ironic. It's a shame that one didn't come up. Yeah. So, here we are. Oh, you're muted. It's muted on YouTube. It's muted on YouTube. Do you want to wind it back? You've got to have the beginning. <laughs> You've got to have the beginning. Of yes, you have. Yeah. <laughs> to come over here, Anglo-Saxons, not to speak it up in language. See? And I do appreciate that I will now look by the worst kind of BBC liberal apologist idiot. If you're all sitting at home watching this, dubbed into Bulgaria. Here they are coming to reality. We've seen it all before, haven't we? We've seen uh, 10 years ago with the, uh, the poles. People are going to have bloody poles coming over here, bloody poles coming over here. to read the instructions for doing it better than us in a second language bloody poles Anglo-Saxon with their in 
I'm still air drumming to that track. <laughs> but um, yeah, so you can see it's a, it's a very unusual combination. And, and uh, I think uh, Stuart Lee himself talked about, well, it's, it's quite unusual to have a record that's kind of funny and comical, but also has something to say. And it's quite, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know how aggressive is it the word, but, but slightly confrontational and forthright about its message. It's, uh, you know, anti-UKIP, anti-xenophobic message. So it was all very cool how it, how it all turned out. And, it, and, and, you know, the track goes on and we're still raising money for Kent Refugee Action Network and all the great work that Bridget and co do, do down there. Um, but yeah, so, but this, is, this, this kind of consciousness that the band has, it's almost instinctive and natural. It's, it's, um, it, it, it goes back to the inception of the group. And immigration and border issues were, 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 were there right at the start because Asian Duff Foundation was originally a music education project and it was formed to try and get young Asians involved in music in order to get them interested in some of the uh, anti-fascist action that was going on in the early 90s in Britain, particularly due to the rise of the BNP in the East End of London. And that was the, um, and, and in fact, Asian Dub Foundation's first gig as a sound system was a anti-BMP uh, benefit. And the original band was two much older members and a very young rapper, Dida, who was like 15. And so the band itself was quite unusual because we were all like youth workers, music tutors, and then we would work and still, still do work with much younger people. So the age range was like, like 15 to early 30s, which was, um, and we were all from very diverse backgrounds, despite the Asian sort of tag. And um, so the interesting thing about the band and makes it quite, you know, there are precedents actually, but we had this sort of parallel rise, a more conventional rise in like getting known by the music press, doing some very big support slots, people like Radiohead and, Rage Against the Machine and what have you, touring America, Mercury Music Prize nomination, all that. But at the same time, it also built a music education uh, profile. And I am a music, I, I, I'm, I'm a, a workshop tutor by trade. And two other people in the band were too. And we, what we were able to do through the success of the group, we were able to make links and um, in very interesting ways. And we were able to get sort of like profile for the whole idea of music education. I'll give you an example. Um, one of the first things I did with the band, we took the band to Budapest and we were involved in a project called Roma Dub Migration. And this was to do with the Roma people in Budapest who, well, as I'm sure you know, the sad thing is I'm talking about, you know, this was a very successful project. It, this is in the late nineties. And, um, you know, it was very positive. It was a really good vibe. We've got people who are treated very, very badly in Hungary, the Roma people. 
And uh, we played on stage with them. And the contact between Roma and the, the, Buddha, the Hungarian majority then was very scant. And there was all kinds of stereotypes, racist stereotypes against them that were really normalized in a way that maybe it was like about black and Asian people in Britain in the early, early 1970s. You know, and one review said when we did the show, the journalist said it seemed like 1000 years of prejudice had evaporated in half an hour. Right. And that's the power of music. I really believe that. But I say that now and look what's happened in Hungary. We've got Orban and, uh, you know, the most dreadful persecution of every kind of minority in Hungary and some invented like, you know, anti-Semitic persecution when there are hardly any Jews in Hungary, you know, so it's actually got a lot worse. So that's quite sad, but at least for that moment, we involved a lot of uh, young people that really didn't get a look in into mainstream Hungarian society, let alone play quite a high profile gig, you know? So, um, and they were great as well. It, we basically combined the Asian Dove Foundation sound with the traditional um, Hungarian Roma music, which is really something else, you know. Um, Steve, could you yeah. could you explain to us more about um, about an earlier track as well, Migration yeah. uh, Fortress Europe? Yeah, I was just and getting then, to that right now. Yeah, perfect. Um, now, and then and then we'll go to jazz, maybe. Absolutely, after, yeah. So, you know, after you talk about that one, great. Yeah. So one of the other tracks, I mean, this track was released in like two thousand and three, and it, its genesis was I met a a filmmaker in France who'd made a short kind of science fiction piece looking at the future of borders 20 years from 2002 is when I first wrote the lyrics. And um, he was talking about gun turrets, robot guards, a sort of real kind of Terminator kind of view of how borders are going to look in 20 years time. And so we did this song called Fortress Europe when it, and the first opening lyric is 2022, a new European order and all the kind of description and sort of talking about uh, the 21st century exodus, that, you know, there should be no borders. If you don't like the effects, don't produce the cause. Well, they were basically pro-immigrant, anti-xenophobic, pro-migrant, pro-refugee set of lyrics in a kind of sci-fi context. And uh, over the past 20 years, the track has gone viral in uh, various uh, times. Like, for example, the war in Yugoslavia and the influx of refugees from Yugoslavia. That's when the track was released. And there was a whole lot of stuff that you probably remember, some of you, about people from Serbia and um, Albania coming in illegally to Britain. Um, and that's what it actually addressed at the time. Then there was other times like uh, when David Cameron was talking about the swarm of Syrian refugees. The track went viral then. And of course, all around Brexit now, you know, and, and if you, the comments, they're quite harrowing and quite scary and horrible to read, but they're almost like a kind of short history of the various sort of um, um, narratives around, um, around immigration, both positive and extremely negative, if you read the comments. And we've got a lot of people sort of saying 2022 is coming. This song has predicted the future, kind of crazy stuff like that. So, um, well, anyway, Jeff, if you want to play uh, Fortress Europe.
as you can see, when that first came out, it was actually attacking the EU's immigration policy with regard particularly to Yugoslavia. But now you can see it's completely turned around the meaning. And when we've been playing it live before lockdown, it was like, oh yeah, Brexit and all the problems flowing from Brexit. So, you know, the Fortress Europe was actually Fortress Britain. You see what I mean? Steve, thanks. We'll, we'll, we'll come back as well uh, shortly to some more conversation with you and, and with Jazz and, and others as well. Um, but but let's let's hear a bit more, Jazz. I, I'd love for you to explain. I mean, it's it's really obvious this week why we need the worldwide tribe. Uh, but when did you realise that was needed? Like, what what was the origin of that, and and, and what's happening? I, I'd love for you to explain a bit more about what the worldwide tribe is and and, and the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. Although following that, Steve, all I want to do now is party. That was an absolute banger. Um, thank you for that. And it's such a pleasure to be here with everybody. I really appreciate you all for being here tonight. As Matt and Steve have said before me, it's, it couldn't be more apt timing to be talking about the issue of migration in the UK. I mean, hopefully you guys have all seen what's been going on with Pretty Patel's overhaul of our asylum system in the last couple of days. And it's going to have pretty devastating consequences for people on the ground. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But yeah, I will start by giving you a little bit of the Worldwide Tribe story. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, Matt, can you give me a thumbs up? Can you go see that? Okay, excellent. Um, I'll start from the beginning, shall I? So um, the Worldwide Tribe is um, a community of people who support refugees and um, who care about the world, the people that we share it with, I guess. And what we're really about is celebrating our differences, um, recognizing our similarities, recognizing what makes us all human, you know, finding connection um, and basic compassion and, and empathy. Um, and I think we could all do with a bit more of that, especially in our politics right now. <clears throat> and the essence of the Worldwide Tribe is that, you know, in an era of globalization, surely we can come together in one worldwide tribe, regardless of borders and nationalities and religions and other superficial things that might divide us, right? Um, but I actually want to start today by telling you a bit of a story about one person in particular, someone who is very important to me, and his name is Mez. So Mez is from Eritrea. And when I met Mez, I had no idea about Eritrea, where it was, what was happening there. Um, but it turns out that they have compulsory military service in Eritrea. And Mez was very scared of being in the army. So when he was growing up, his older brother uh, had already gone into the army and his father was in and out of prison for fleeing the army. And both of them had horrible stories to tell about what it meant to be in the army in Eritrea. Um, so it, in late 2014, Mez was about to turn 13 years old. He was 12 and he knew that his time was coming soon, right? It wouldn't be long before he would too be conscripted to the army. They start very young. And Mez always says, he puts it very beautifully. He says that what he wanted, what he needed was to go to school, to finish his education. He wanted to hold a pen and not a gun, right? So the day that the army came to Mez's village to conscript him and other 13 year old boys of his age, him and two of his best friends ran. And they ran without a plan. They didn't know that they would not be going back. They didn't take anything with them. They didn't say goodbye to their mums. Mez didn't get an opportunity to tell his mum that he was safe until six weeks later after he'd crossed the border into Ethiopia. So Eritrea borders Ethiopia and Sudan it's in East Africa. Um, I'm just saying that for if anyone like me doesn't know, I'm sure you guys do. But as I say, I was coming to this very naive when I first met Mez. And when Mez made it to Sudan, he lived in a refugee camp for a few months. Uh, and he realized that this too wasn't the place where he would be able to continue the life that he wanted to go to school, to live in safety. He knew that he had to continue. So Mez continued his journey to Libya 
in which he needed to cross the Sahara. It took him 15 days to do so. And one of Meza's friends didn't make it on that crossing. He fell off the truck that they were carrying on. Meza never saw him again. So this journey was difficult, very, very difficult at many points, the Sahara being one of the low points. It took him 15 days, as I said, they didn't have food. They had minimal water. Mez always says that it wasn't the hunger that he felt, it was the thirst. And eventually he made it to Libya, which many refugees have described to me since as being hell on earth. And he realized that there too, he couldn't stay. He couldn't stay in Libya. That also wasn't the country that would give him the opportunities that he so wanted and deserved for his life, right? So he knew he couldn't go back. He couldn't stay there, so he had to continue. And from Libya, the next stage of the journey is crossing the Mediterranean Sea. Now you guys, I'm sure, have seen those crossings on boats, rubber dinghies, big uh, overcrowded boats that are just absolutely not fit for purpose. And Mez was scared, right? He'd never seen the sea, he couldn't swim, um, but he knew that he had no other option but to take this risk. And Mez's nightmare came true when he crossed the Mediterranean. His boat capsized and everyone on board fell into the water. And Mez describes looking up at the sky and thinking, you know, this is it. I'm, I'm going to die here in the Mediterranean. And Thankfully, a miracle happened and Mez was saved from the Mediterranean by the Italian Coast Guard. Now, again, as I say, this really was a miracle because this is the end of 2014, early 2015, when more rescue boats and Coast Guards were operating in the search and rescue zones in the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, less and less rescue boats are operating in this piece of sea, this area of the sea. And Increasing amounts of people are dying in the Mediterranean. So Mez was one of the lucky ones. He was rescued. He was taken to Italy, where he was wrapped in an emergency blanket, given a plate of spaghetti, and essentially left to continue his journey alone. Mez hoped that once he made it to Europe, this would be the place that he could find safety, right? That this would be, okay, I'm in Europe now. Here, I will be safe. But he heard of many previous Eritreans being deported back to Eritrea from Italy. So he continued his journey. He walked across Europe until he made it to France. Sometimes he bumped on trains. He tells the story about one time when the ticket man came and he had no money and a German lady put her arm around him and bought him a ticket and said to the ticket man that he was with her, which I always think is a really beautiful story. And I, I appreciate that lady. So Mez eventually found himself in the Calais jungle the notorious Calais jungle. And again, you know, this was not a place for human beings to live, not a place for a 13 year old boy to live. It's not safe. Uh, the people don't have their basic needs covered there, but there was no other option for Mers in France. Again, many people were being deported from France to Eritrea. It's very difficult to get your asylum claim heard or accepted due to pure numbers. So Mez, he listened to people before him and people around him who were trying to make it to the UK, where he was told that he would have the best chance of getting his asylum claim accepted. So one day in the summer, or one night in the summer of 2015, Mez hid underneath the Eurotunnel train and he made it to the UK. And that Sunday morning, social services in Kent in uh, in Folkestone they gave him some food and they gave him these big flip-flops that didn't fit him because his shoes were wet and his clothes were wet and they put him in a taxi to my mum and dad's house and my mum and dad had just come to the end of a long process of becoming foster parents so Mez that day became my foster brother the process had taken my mum and dad nine months and it had taken Mez nine months. And my mum always says that it was like a pregnancy. It's like the same as having a new baby. And that's literally what she felt like and acted like. <laughs> and Mez um, became the first of four foster brothers in my family who were all unaccompanied minors, all refugees. And they all arrived to the UK taking similar routes like this. They're all from different countries, from Eritrea, Afghanistan, 
Sudan and Libya. And these are some of the highlights of these last six years for us. So you can see uh, when there's, uh, well, he didn't speak English when he came to the UK. He learned English very quickly. He went to our local comprehensive school. He was voted prom king. Uh, this is, I think there's a picture of him getting his travel documents here. Um, and not only this, Mez now often works together with me to share his story. This is a picture of him at that local comprehensive school uh, in, in Kent, um, in our local area. Um, after he'd finished, going back to tell his story, which he does a much better job of me, by the way. Um, but he, tell, he, he wanted to share with the students there so that if there were more unaccompanied minors coming to that school, that the students would have a little bit of an understanding of what had happened to him, right? Because when Mez first got there and people asked him, where are you from? When he said Eritrea, same reaction that I had, you know, people didn't know, they had no idea. Uh, and they didn't understand what Mez had had to get, had had to go through to get to the same point that they were at, going to school every day being able to continue his education, something that we take so much for granted, right? So Mez's journey came to a bit of an end, um, or at least one part of his journey came to an end when he made it to the UK. It was a whole nother journey, uh, I guess, integrating, learning, uh, seeing our culture through his eyes. But it really sparked the beginning of a journey for me because at that time, as Steve mentioned, um, it was the summer of 2015 when the media was full of the refugee crisis, but not in a positive way. Uh, the representation of the people in Calais was super negative, stuff like swarms of migrants, marauding migrants, um, as Steve mentioned. And I really felt that there wasn't any kind of, um, human story underneath that you know the questions that I had about who these people were what happened to them why they were there uh, the, the places that they come from you know at the time I think we really associated the word refugee with um, the war in Syria but actually in Calais you know there were there were some Syrians but there were predominantly Eritreans Afghans uh, Sudanese people um, and I met incredible people from all over the world and when I Okay, I've, I've skipped forward basically, but I, I essentially decided that I wanted to go to Calais and find out more and answer some of these questions myself. And as I say, I met people from everywhere and it wasn't actually the conditions that shocked me most when I first went. Although the fact that people were sleeping in tents in the mud was crazy, 3000 people, men, women, children, the conditions were mental. And the fact that there were no large NGOs working on the ground as I expected you know I went there very naive I didn't have a background in the humanitarian sector I didn't know what to expect but I expected if there were children living in a refugee camp in Europe that there would be save the children that there would be the UNHCR that there would be the Red Cross you know those names that we know that they would be there that they would be present on the ground and they weren't there was no one present on the ground. There was one French lady from Calais who became a hero of mine, Maya. And she had been helping refugees in that area for years and years because she had grown up in Calais. And this has been a situation in Calais for a very long time. So I met Maya, but I didn't meet any, anyone else, any other volunteers that time when I first went early days of the jungle, right? And when I was making my journey home from Calais, I really felt that there was an injustice at play, that there was something just so crazy. I can't even find the words to describe the feeling that I could make that journey home from France to the UK so easily in the comfort of my car. You know, I could drive onto the Eurotunnel train and Med, Mez had to hide underneath. He had to tie his shoelaces to the bottom of the train so that they, his feet wouldn't drag on the track like 
we're talking we're talking about people risking their lives on a daily basis to make the same journey that you know with the comp with this power of have i got my passport in here maybe not um but with the power of this little book i could so easily make it didn't make sense to me it doesn't make sense it's completely nonsensical and i was really feeling that basically on the journey home especially because i felt like on that first trip i made connections with people that were just like you or me that you know are just human beings the same as we all are anyway so I went home and I did what I did at that point which is write about it on Facebook I'm not using Facebook so much these days but at the time I was and I, I wanted my friends and family I guess to know about the situation to know that I wanted to go again to know that people needed basic stuff like tents sleeping bags warm clothing they were cold at night they were hungry during the day Anyway, that post, let me see, what's this little video? Oh yeah, that post, next morning I got up to go to work and it had been shared thousands and thousands of times. And I did something very, very stupid on that post by sharing my address and my mum and dad's address for the people in Kent and for the people in London, just saying like, if you've got any stuff, drop it over, we'll bring it to Calais. Little did I know what that would uh, lead to. And as you can see, this is one of our donation drop days. Um, and we were overwhelmed basically by the incredible outpouring of support from people, not just all over the UK, all over Europe in the end. We had drop off days, donation days, people sending Amazon deliveries to us with brand new tents, putting together care packages, writing notes, knitting warm clothing. It was like, absolutely unreal. The response that we had to I guess this I, I guess people were ready to hear a bit of a different story um, and that was the beginning of the worldwide tribe that was the beginning of this online community where we shared information to do our best to support refugees and asylum seekers initially in Calais we extended our work to Greece to Turkey to Jordan to Lebanon and we started with basic needs, tents, sleeping bags, shoes. Lots of people like Mez in Calais didn't have proper footwear. It was cold, it was muddy. Um, anyway, I soon realized that actually, although tents and sleeping bags were hugely valuable and important and life-saving, you know, these camps shouldn't be there in the first place. As much of this stuff that you can distribute they shouldn't exist. People shouldn't be living like this at all. So we decided to try and raise awareness to educate, I guess, in, because I feel like if you can get to the bottom of the issue, if you can really dig down to the, to the very lower levels, like what's going on here? I think it's a lack of understanding and, and, and information about the situation, right? Because anybody who actually knew what Mez had been through, what this, this kid Nahom had been through, what the people in these camps had been through to get there. They were heroes, they were all heroes. And so we started to make film. Um, we started to um, give more talks and things. And we started to create infographics that like unpicked some of the myths. And most recently we started a podcast. The Worldwide Tribe podcast has been running for nearly two years now, um, but it highlights and amplifies the stories of these incredible people. and humans behind these headlines, I guess, and just incredible stories that I've heard over these years. Um, one of my guests, Awad, is on the call today. You're gonna to be hearing from him very shortly, hopefully. Um, he was my second ever guest on the podcast and a very good friend of mine. Um, I've heard from, this is Gawali, Gawali Pasali, who wrote an incredible book called The Lightless Sky. If anyone wants something, I think there's a pic, oh yeah, it's on the desk, on the desk in this picture. Um, so it's his story of arriving to the UK as a child refugee um, from Afghanistan. Uh, here's Mez doing uh, an episode with me. He's my only guest that's been on two episodes because the story is so epic. The journey from Eritrea to the UK and then the second episode was his life since he's been in the UK, which is a whole journey of itself. But you know, over the years, I guess, asking questions and digging deeper below the surface and trying to kind of unpick some of the fear that we have around the other, um, 
I've been to all sorts of places and met incredible people, as I say, but this year, all of our travel has been more restricted, right? Because of the pandemic, because of COVID. And actually it's helped us to focus closer to home. And there's so much happening close to home that we need to pay attention to. Um, for example, we saw in the last year, in the last summer, an increase in crossings on the channel in boats, right? That was in our news all over again. And so in response to that, we made a little film. We're still making films often. Let me see if I can, here you go. Um, and this film features Mez and my Sudanese brother, Bijo. We shot it in Hastings. And I'd love to finish uh, today with sharing it with you because for me, this film really highlights the essence of the World Wide Tribe, the reason why we do what we do, I guess the reason why we exist. Um, and it's also very personal to me. It's the first time we've shared Mez's story in this way through film. Um, it shares a little bit from my mum. And yeah, I'll stop talking about it and I'll show it to you. And I hope that you guys enjoy it. An attempt by migrants to cross the channel from France has resulted in tragedy after two adults and two children died when the boat carrying them sank. French officials say that 15 others have been taken to hospital. We've heard today that a teenager, a 16 year old has been found dead beach in Calais. We believe that it's a migrant from Sudanese descent. I just remember how cold the water was when the boat capsized. That's all I could feel. I had never seen the sea before. The darkness of the water surprised me. I was very, very scared. Our smuggler told us not to move around at all. None of us could swim. If I go in, I'll die. The only thing that we can do is hold each other in tights and pray so we don't drown. This is the house that uh, I arrived five years ago. The taxi driver was trying to find the house and everything, and then he pulled out of it here. And I was literally standing here, same, and then I didn't know what to expect. I don't know if it's Eritrean family or English family. When they opened the door, it was a lot of happy people, welcoming, very nice. The happiest day of my life. On the day that he came, we'd all been waiting. And there he was. His eyes were yeah, full of trauma. I just wanted to put my arms around him and tell him it would all be okay. But he was safe now. I've now gone through the process three more times with the other boys. And each time it has brought me so much joy. My mum, this family means literally everything to me. It feels like a dream. I didn't know these boys five years ago, but now they're my sons. As soon as I got to this house, I feel connected to them just like that. We all love each other, respect each other. This is what I love about this family. I feel happy, safe, and I feel loved. I love having all my family at home around a big dinner table. And there's always space for one more person. I'm not just caring for them, I love them. Um, but yeah, that's the, the story, really. Um, I've got loads more that I could talk about. And I really wanted to share Mez's story today because I think that, you know, 
it's really important right now to recognise the implications on of this overhaul of the asylum system on people. And under Priti Patel's new plans, Mez would be deported immediately to Eritrea. And many, many people and friends that I've made would too. And future people like Mez, you know, Mez has got a little brother who's also just left Eritrea to go to Ethiopia because he doesn't want to be in the army. And he has no opportunity to speak to seek asylum in England now. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's really important for us to be talking about this, for us to understand the impact on on human lives um, of of what our government is is proposing right now. So thank you for listening to me, and thank you for watching that video with me and bearing with me because it's yeah, it's an important one on a personal level, I guess. I mean, it's hard it's hard it's hard to uh, to not to say really after watching watching that jazz. Um, I mean, is a word here? Is uh, you know, can he can he join us as well? Um, I think he is. A word? Are you here? I hope so. Let's have a look. I saw his name on the list. Word. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hmm. I can see him in the list of participants, but I can't see his little square. Hey, hello, hello. Oh, yay. Can't see you. <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. And I'm so grateful that you're here with us today, Awad, because just to give you guys a little bit of background, Awad and I met in Calais when he was living in the jungle, and he taught me so much about patience about kindness about sharing i mean he just w became a kind of informal leader of the sudanese community built entirely on respect uh, you know he was living in the camp himself but working to working with volunteers to help with distribution um, so it's just an honor that you're actually here with us today Awad, and i'm happy to see your face Jazz, before you continue Hi, the hello, conversation, Dave. could you could you kindly put your um, headphones back in so we don't get feedback? That would be amazing. Can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, hello, guys. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share a part of my story and to be a part of the great work you are doing. Uh, my name is uh, Awad. I'm a refugee from Sudan based in Edinburgh. I left Sudan 2011. I came through a long journey, made it to Turkey, Turkey to Greece. I lived in Greece for a couple of years. I went to jail and that was the first time in the whole entire of my life to, to be in a jail. It's just for no reason. And yeah, I tried many times to just live free. Um, cross to Albania, Macedonia, uh, sorry, Albania, Montenegro. And then I got caught there, sent back to Greece again, then made it to France. And yeah, I've been in college jungle for three years trying to, yeah, to make it to the UK and finally happened. And yeah, it was really, really hard, hard, hard journey. But yeah, I've learned a lot, a lot of lessons that shaped my life. And I trust the process, accepting the hardship, it will happen along my journey and along the way to success. And also having faith and believe that things will work out on its own way so yeah that gives me like a hope to continue and you know to do like same what i used to do in cali trying helping people trying to be support supportive and this one one of the things also motivate me to yeah to do more and more and helping raise awareness and to bring back the unheard voice again and yeah to discuss 
one of the very important issues now, the refugee crisis. And I really appreciate the great work that you are doing, guys, and thank you very much. And thank you for giving me that time. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Awad. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And and uh, thanks for sharing with us. I um I, I wonder like how how what we've been like Jazz, I've been I've been watching your your Instagram stories this week and I've seen burning worlds, I've seen I've seen statements around the Home Secretary and, and, and migration stories. Steve, similarly with you, I've seen the stories on the ADF uh, uh, feeds as well around um, all kinds of plights around the world that's going on right now. I wonder if there's anything, first of all, Jazz, I wonder if there's anything you want to talk about, about what's happening at, you know, currently right now, like what are, what, what are the things this week uh, especially but more generally like how can people help how can people get involved what can people do as individuals um how can we use our own voices uh, to, to join in and support these stories that we've been hearing about tonight because i think one of the most difficult things for individuals often is like how to support how to get involved what what we can do uh, you know beyond like collectivism or, or signing something like what you know what, what are those things and so I'd love more context about where we are currently from you because I know how involved you are, if that's okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I would say first things first is that actually it is really valuable. I know signing something doesn't always feel like a big action or writing to your MP, but I've recognised in the last five years how important that actually is and can be. You know, we live in a country where we do have democracy and it is important to be kind of exercising those rights as much as we can. So on Choose Love's uh, Instagram, there's a petition to stop uh, this overhaul, this proposal from Priti Patel um, of the new asylum plans. Um, so I would recommend anyone, everyone to go and sign that. It will take literally minutes. Um, <clears throat> so that's a good place to start. But in terms of what you can do and how you can get involved, there are so many ways um, so through the worldwide tribe there are the obvious ways of volunteering with our friends indigo volunteers they place people in um, volunteer placements uh, grassroots volunteer placements they're wonderful i would really recommend checking them out um, but also donating i think there's a donation link in our chat um, but maybe it's not money or time that you have to give you know but i always say that you don't actually need either of those things there are things that you can do literally today which is examples of like reading Gowali's book The Lightless Sky that's a great place to start um watching a film tonight I don't know if any of you guys have seen For Summer that's on 4OD it's free um it's amazing um again I'm thinking about people that were on my podcast so the director Wad um she made she she filmed um, for summer whilst she was living under siege in Aleppo for five years and she was a guest on the podcast and uh, has a really incredible story. Sama is her daughter and she uh, documented her journey for her daughter to highlight why they stayed in Aleppo. Um, you're listening to the podcast, listen to Awad's episode, mine and Awad's episode, uh, you'll get an opportunity to get some amazing insights from him. Um, there but yeah there's lots of what I think you know education and, and learning in your own like space in your own world is, is really important um, so I think those are, are really easy ways to, to cur curate in your Instagram feed you know follow Asian Dub Foundation follow Choose Love follow um, there's so many incredible people doing like grassroots people doing incredible work um, so I would also recommend that so that you can be ready when the opportunities come up. RA, I think I can see Ishana here from RA Fest. That's another great, great organisation to be following. 
And that's R W A H. Yeah, I could go on and on, Matt. You've got to stop me. <laughs> oh no, that's that's. I mean, I don't want to stop you. I just want like let's 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 put them all in the chat, and then we can we can share them all on Hawkwood's social medias and website following this and you know and when we when we put this on on youtube so people can watch again that couldn't make it tonight because of time zones or whatever else uh you know we can share all those links in there as well uh, so that people can get involved uh, and and follow the things where they can find out a little bit more about what's happening outside of the mainstream media um, yeah and i think uh, just one more thing that i remember now as you say that is having these conversations having these conversations is so important having these difficult conversations with people that you know we've all got that friend or family member or who might have a different viewpoint from us and having these sharing information sharing the posts you know we just put out um the seven main points of Pretty Patel's uh, proposal on our Instagram which breaks it down to be very accessible to understand so reading that and sharing it and maybe one more person will see it and think oh okay that I don't want that maybe they'll add to the you know it's it's a ripple it's a ripple and I think mm. that social media really enables us to connect with people and like really harness the, the power of people coming together yeah I, I I totally agree I mean were it not for that and were it not for me following your account there's so many things that I would know nothing about because it never gets covered anywhere you know so and and, and equally you know with you know the, the reason why I was really excited about uh Jazz and Steve tonight is because I I feel like I learned so much from music my whole life you know bands that talked about things consciously and had a reason for existing you know whether it whether it came from whatever genre, but it's just an amazing opportunity um, to communicate. And, and, and the Worldwide Tribe and social media has that same impact, uh, you know, across generations. There's, there's an ability to talk about things in a way that, you know, that the news, the news doesn't necessarily do, the BBC doesn't necessarily cover, or, you know, although has a, you know, has a, has a purpose to do so um so let, let's put them in the chat as well so like if 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 there's any links let, let's put them in the chat and and we can share them later anyway but then people can take them away um uh Wad, you know I, I i don't know what to say you know it, it's just so inspiring to hear your story I, i'm i'm so i feel so privileged that you're with us tonight and talking to us about you know your own story and your own experience like to me that feels such a precious thing you know I, I i'm really delighted that that you could join us so thank you so much uh, and steve you talked about um the origins uh, of this anti-racism campaign this this need for education this 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 activism through music and you know, and, and using the voice you've got, even even to the tune of like a, a number one single, like you said, it's like the charts, you know, what's the charts if you work in independent music. But, you know, so, you know, I'm just really curious about about where you're at now, what's on your mind now, what the next steps are in terms of things that you're also working on that you want to bring to people's attention this evening as well. Yeah, I just wanted to make two points, actually, one very general and one very specific, actually. One thing Jazz said, which I think is really, really important, is um, bringing the stories to the public, putting a face to things, putting a story just like Jazz did, you know. And um, because if you think if you cast your mind back like five or six years to when David Cameron made that appalling speech, you know, very cynically put together, using the word swarm, a swarm of Syrian migrants coming in. I think I'm right in saying within about two or three weeks, and it took um, the Turkish, uh, poor Turkish boy to drown in the sea. Yeah? Then all of a sudden, the whole tone of the national conversation changes. Right? And all of a sudden, Daily Mail and Daily Express, who've been, you know, you know, pure xenophobia, a complete dehumanization of talking about you know, an inferior people coming in en masse, right? It took a little boy to die and a face being put to it before they start saying, oh, oh, we feel so sorry. Oh, no, you know. And then David Cameron himself started saying about, oh, the tragedy and what have you. 
all right? Now that's an extreme version, but basically the, the last thing that the xenophobes and the right wing want is for you to put a face to the people. Right? And that's why Jazz's film was so, so important, I think. And I think getting, seeing what people are doing, you know, seeing how people are integrating in schools, the work people are doing, right? The contribution that people who settle here make is so important. And you just keep hammering it. I mean, I mean, we, we kind of did it with Stuart Lee on coming over here. I mean, that's a wild sort of, uh, you know, uh, outlying example. But it was putting in the consciousness at, about the positive contribution of immigration and also who we took, who are immigrants. The Anglo-Saxons were as well. Invaders even, you know, that's an outlier. But a more specific thing is the one thing that um, was really nice uh, that, that happened because of the track. I got... Uh, uh, contacted by um, an organization called the Community Integration Awards. Um, and Joe Cox's sister spoke at it. You know, so yeah, Joe Cox's sister, Asian Dove Foundation with the track. And we were handing out, or, or we, were, we were sort of joining in with the, the actual awards that were being handed out to what were largely refugee and asylum seeker uh, driven projects. Right, so it's worth looking at that community integration awards, a fantastic array of projects, um, mainly run by uh, asylum seekers, refugees, everything range, ranging from music projects, which were very similar to um, mm. the kind of things that I did with community music and ADF, to things as diverse as beekeeping projects, which were absolutely fascinating, which was run by a Syrian refugee. Uh, I'm not sure where it was, but um, you can find out. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing, you know, um, put the faces out there, show what, what, you know, what the people, that pretty Patel's vicious kind of light and deliberately kind of you know, sadistic. You know, I, I do think there is a genuine sense of sadism about this, uh, this particular uh, brand of conservatism, you know, coming from uh, a daughter of uh, immigrants herself you know, who would not have been, I mean, despite her protestations, her parents would not have been allowed in under any, uh, any of the regime that we have now, you know, so it, it, it's sort of doubly sickening. We need to expose it and we need to show the people, you know, show the stories, the pain, the reality of it, and not let the Daily Mail or whatever just turn it into people, for want of a better term, SHIT, to be shoveled, because that is really the, the how it's framed. Yeah. Steve, the other thing you touched on earlier, but didn't get into really was education and, yeah. and, and that side of music. And I'm thinking about community music here. Yeah. And, and, you know, could you just tell us a little bit briefly about, you know, what that is, uh, how it founded um, and and your continuing involvement with it and how that connects to things like Rich Mix and, you know, the, the whole sort of network yeah. of what goes on uh, around Asian Dove Foundation that's not about selling records that gets to number one. There's actually purely for the, <laughs> you know, as great as that is, but there's actually a hugely important uh, purpose behind your work. And I don't want it to come across that it's just like, you know, it's all about selling records, making, making music and being at number one. There's this massively expansive education aspect to what ADF do, right? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it has changed a lot. It's, it's not how it was when we started in the 90s, you know, but I, I, I can give you a flavour of it. I mean, one of the first things that I did was a, a project in a place called Asian Action Group in Turnpike Lane. And um, this was a, a tough place. I mean, there was, um, there was a green outside the Asian Action Group youth club the place. Basically, it was like, you know, cocaine and crack were being dealt and a lot of problems with drug gangs, with gangs generally. And um, I remember I walked in there um, with a sampler and a drum machine and a microphone. And um, we got a kind of jungle group going. And all the kids brought their samples in, we put it all together. And then we said, what's this track going to be about? And then on the wall, there was this cartoon which said, uh, there was a caricature of a judge who just said in court, 
oh, all these Bengalis look the same to me. Right? This, is, this has been, and that was on the wall. And so I had this sort of like group of about 10 young Asian kids of about 12 or 13, all jumping up and down, the fist in the air going like, judge say it. All Asians look the same with this heavy bass and and uh, and jungle break. It was really something, you know. And, and that is actually how the Asian Dub Foundation sound evolved, right? It's not just that we were this this group, like you know, getting people involved and whatever. What we, what we did believe, and and this is what was a bit different, and to a lot of sort of like music workshops and what have you, we actually believe fundamentally that giving people access to music whose voices hadn't been heard, right? Who were usually suppressed or pushed out, of the, pushed, you know, taken out of the picture, that actually you get new music, new, vital, exciting, and radical music, right? And, and, and Asian Dub Foundation was the, um, the living proof of that. There's no way the band would have sounded like it did had it not had this route in music education. And this took a lot of people by surprise, you know, the people like the enemy and what have you, who, who had to take notice of us because we had all these kind of people giving us their blessing, like Radiohead, Primal Scream and that. And really we were going doing the complete opposite of rock and roll, which is all about this kind of, you know, massive cult of personality, superstars and slaves and stuff. It was completely opposite, it was egalitarian. And it was basically genuinely saying, you can do this, here are the tools, right? And not, not just like, but people who really never got the chance before, right? Yeah. So that, yeah. that was the kind of like, um, the kind of thread that took us through. Now it's a bit different now. I mean, um, I, mean I, I, re that, I remember that though, Steve, at the mm. time, the Manchester Academy Bratz tour. Yeah. The first time I saw Radio F, like 91, 92, and just it being, literally otherworldly you know compared to everything else that was around in terms of music journalism and everything that was going on so you know it was it was definitely a shot in the arm well you see we weren't you see given the background of the group and also the sign of the overt political for want of a better name that wasn't supposed to be good in that period in the 90s it was all about um it, as i said superstars and slaves and more traditional kind of like superstar mentality you know so we were just so in the face of everything and musically too as well you know because we were a, a live band with guitars and bass but we were actually playing a kind of club sound system based music but we were actually at the time anyway showing up in more traditional guitar groups but basically being better than them, you know and better not because of our egos or whatever or because we are these brilliant musicians but because we'd come out of this philosophy which was bigger than us and a lot older than us as well. You know, we didn't make that community music and the philosophy that it was based on created and facilitated and nurtured it, you know, yeah. and it had been doing yeah. so since the early seventies, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I love this so much for so many reasons, you know, as an individual and, uh, representing Hawkwood tonight as an arts education, uh, a future thinking organisation. You know, we're, we're talking about all of the things that are core to, um, uh, you know, to Hawkwood, but all three of us as well. Um, th there's a great question that came in on the chat that I'd like to put to both of you, which is from uh, Ishana Meadows. How do you both feel about the labels given to people with lived experience of migration and displacement, such as refugees, migrants, immigrants, asylum seekers? Do you feel that these terms are necessary or just cause more divide in society, them and us? A really good question. Thank you, Ishana. And I think that semantics are really important. You know, we have so much uh rhetoric around the term mi migrant um we have a lot of um, negative stereotypes associated with that word even though i'm sure a lot of people here have traveled for work or for economic reasons and are migrants and have been before you know but it's interesting that we don't associate ourselves with that word um i think it's really important to try to move away from labels you know if you are 
officially um, you have refugee status, it's still because you of your circumstances that are out of your control. And I think we try to use words that are more passing as a state rather than a label that you are and are forevermore because refugees were refugee were people before they had lives after they had you know they didn't always associate themselves with that word it could happen to anyone at any time so we try and use terms like displaced people or people experiencing live displacement um have lived experience of migration things like that that don't kind of put you in that box because i think if you guys were to you know if i said to you close your eyes and think of a refugee you have a very specific vision of what that looks like someone in a boat you know someone carrying all their bags and that's not representative of the diversity like within that term so yeah i think it's, it's a really important topic to discuss like maybe you have something to add to that as well steve because yeah, I think it very, very much is is can be and is divisive, especially how we use these terms in our media as well. Well, all these terms are constantly in flux, aren't they? And they are actually mm. sort of infused with uh, a, an ever changing agenda. I think the big problem when we're talking about stuff like uh, terms like refugee and asylum seeker is there are actually very strict legal definitions aren't they? I mean, they're actually sort of like handed down from above. And we have to, if, well, a person like yourself, Jazz, maybe less me, but, uh, or anyone involved with the actual legal side or defensive side have to use uh, these terms. It's not like, say, I, I think it's in a slightly different category to say, I don't know, issues around gendering or race or what have you because these terms are actually have a legal basis and, and in a way you can't get away from them, from that. So I think that's an additional problem, you know, that, that, that you're actually dealing with official words that are the category that actually defines your position and status on paper, plus all the negative stuff that is associated with them. So I think, I think that's a difficult one actually, and it's hard to replace them because, um, they have such an everyday consequence and you can't really get away from it. You know, I mean, I can complain about, you know, being called black or Asian or what have you, find other terms, but I'm not necessarily tied to that in a legal sense. You know, I'm not, not legally one particularly race or another. If you see, if you get my meaning. No, we actually made a, um, a film that is relevant to this, which is just like two minutes long. I don't know if you guys would be interested in like finishing up by like watching that. Um, does that sound like something? Yeah. yeah? I just yeah. sent it to you, Miriam, if you want to share it so that we don't have an audio issue again. Yeah. Um, but hopefully this speaks to that question. Mm. I'm dentist from Kabul. I'm mechanic. Uh, I study agriculture engineering. Yeah, I was studying university. What did you study? Uh, energy. I'm engineer. Shoe driver. <laughs> Mother. Mother. <laughs> I work with British Army in Afghanistan. I was a cable guy. A job in the boutique and fashion, a man and woman. Hmm. Yes, center Baghdad. My life, it was good. I, I don't have economical problems. Just, I have my life problem. First, I have dignity in my country. This is first. Second, I have respect. Our life was so, so lovely. We have everything in our city. I feel more comfortable in my country. But because of war, I escape. But now we, have, we don't have anything. Because the war... Yeah. It's very difficult to live with uh, without family. Without family, you just like a a lone tree. No one can help you. No one can care you. Uh, Iraq, Iraq uh, problem. Iraq no good. The family in Iraq, no family. Finish.
we try to forget what happened to us. We try to do something to, you know, uh, make better, you know, just football or some hobbies. We play cards, we play chess, we go to swim, we, we do, but just to make time goes. Just we want to finish the day. Nothing more, nothing less. But not to have fun because because nothing nothing will make us happy here. We are just waiting for a bright day. We are waiting for a bright day. I know this is a night. It's a night. One day will become a bright day. And we are just waiting for a bright day. Thank you, Jazz. Um, oh, let me see. Hold on. Uh, we've got some more. We've got some more comments and a, and a few more a few more things coming in. And then you know, uh, let's have a look. Um, sanctuary and cities do great work in cities all over the UK. Always looking for volunteers and support. Look up your city sanctuary and see if there's a group in your area. Thank you, Rachel for that comment. Um, I'm sure there's lots of comments in here, as well as um, opportunities to connect. Uh, if you're on the call tonight on any platform and you want to put your contact details on Instagram, on Facebook, on Zoom, or to email us later, please do. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to connect all of you together. I think it's a really important thing. So. We're looking for solutions and continuing conversation as much as we're looking for, you know, debate and to, to highlight speakers. I know for Jazz and for Steve tonight was as much about uh, a community event and to include as many people as possible as it was about talking about what Worldwide Tribe and Asian Dub Foundation uh, do, uh, you know, individually. So, so please do, you know, share with us. Rachel, yes, I'm sure that they would love uh, uh, to allow you to use that video in your teaching. I know you're a teacher as well uh, as, as your day job. Thanks so much for being here and I, I'm sure we can sort that out as well. So we could go on all night because we've not even touched the end of the refugee crisis and, 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 and the history of you know the migrant issues. Jazz, Steve, thank you so much for sharing with us. We'll continue to share your links. We'll continue to share when we publish the film on YouTube. And um, yeah, just thank you for your time. And uh, Alicia, um, would you like to, to, to close the evening? Yes, um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you again, um, Jazz and Steve. It, it has been so thought provoking and so moving to share your work with us tonight. And I look forward to um, sharing with everyone who's joined us this evening the resources that you've shared with us so we can follow up and people can really get engaged um, in supporting your incredible work. So from the bottom of our heart at Hawkwood, thank you for being with us tonight and um, sharing this important conversation that matters. Thank you so much. And thank you to all uh, of you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Such a pleasure.